after I interviewed Dr. Arambula on Sunday Morning Matters uh, a few weeks back, you took to Twitter pretty much right after I posted it online, and, and you wrote, and we actually can put this up on screen, uh, you wrote, lightweight, I cannot wait to debate this guy. Um, what did you mean by that, first of all? And, and second of all, now that the three of us are here, do, do you still feel that same way? No, I think that uh, I think my opponent is doing a, a, a good job here uh, discussing the issues. Uh, I think that uh, he's correctly identified uh, Sacramento and the special interests as the problem, uh, but unfortunately he's bought and paid for by the special interests in Sacramento that are bankrolling his campaign to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars they're spending to take me out. Uh, that's why I couldn't wait to get in here with you. Uh, that's why I couldn't wait to get in here with him because these are the things that folks want to know. These are the things that folks need to know. I got another question. I'll start with you mm -hmm. here, Dr. Rambula. You identify raising the minimum wage as one of your priorities. It says it right there on your mm -hmm. website. Right next to that on your website, you also talk about helping out small businesses. Mm -hmm. The thing is, a lot of people in small business, they come to us and they say that raising the minimum wage might run the risk of putting them out of, of, of business. So how do you reconcile those two things and what is a fair minimum wage here in the Valley? So that's a great question and I'm glad you asked it. You know, I, I want to raise the minimum wage because people cannot make ends meet. There is no living wage currently. When we look at when the minimum wage was started and we calculate it up for inflation, where it would be now, it's much more than the $10 per hour. And so I'm not an economist. I don't pretend to know exactly what, that, what we need to raise it to, but I know we need to raise it so that people can make ends meet. I am concerned about small businesses. My wife and her family, they, they run small businesses, a brick and mortar uh, a uniform store and a, and a few uh, sports bars here in town. And I am concerned about small businesses and the effect it will have. But we have to raise the minimum wage. That's how we start to affect poverty. That's how we start helping our community, is putting more money in people's pockets so that they can actually start spending it in our communities. All right. Well, let me get that 90 second, up to 90 seconds rebuttal on that. When it comes to minimum wage, small businesses. Yes. Uh, my opponent's policies would put his family's restaurants under. There was a story in the Fresno Bee today about all the closures. Uh, small businesses have enough to worry about without having to worry about politicians in Sacramento arbitrarily throwing a dart to find uh, what would be the best minimum wage. The job of Fresno mayor is a giant responsibility. Fresno is California's fifth largest city, 34th in the country, and it's the financial and economic hub of the Central Valley. Fresno uses a strong mayor form of government. That means the mayor has more executive power and policy say than in other cities. Ashley Swearingen has held this role for eight years, guiding the city through a great recession and urging an inner city renaissance that has many downtown optimistic for the first time in decades. But there are still problems. Violent crime is up, local police face more scrutiny than ever, and issues like homelessness, housing, and drought persist. Two candidates are still standing in the race to take on these challenges, Councilman Lee Brand and Supervisor Henry Perea. Both bring experience and an army of supporters, but only one can get the job. Tonight, they meet face-to-face -face on KC24, with many in Fresno still undecided on who they'll vote to be the next mayor. I want to talk about homelessness. That's a serious issue all over Fresno. It's one of those issues that it's not just confined to one part right. of town. I mean, homelessness is everywhere. Panhandling is everywhere. Supervisor Perea, I know that you've said that you want to put these panhandlers to work, to give them the opportunity to work for money, not to beg for money. How right. would that Pro, how would that program work, and, and how would we pay for that? Well, in the, I mean, that, that's really a micro of the bigger issue of, of homelessness, but just an example, the, the mayor of Albuquerque has initiated a plan, and every day his, his city crews will go out to those corners and uh, work for food. Okay, we'll jump in the truck. We'll give you four or five hours of work, minimum wage for the day. Uh, we're going to feed you, but we're going to give you a lot of counseling services too. The, the, the whole key, really, the goal is get them off the street, mm -hmm. assess them, and then get them into services. That's really what that plan is. And I think it's, it's been very effective in Albuquerque. And I think what, what's effective about it is the next visit, if the person says, no, that's no, okay, I'll stay on this corner uh, and beg for money, then the next visit is from a police officer and the person moved off the corner. I mean, th this is a quality of life issue for this community. And people are saying, we don't mind helping people. Uh, it, we're a very giving community. But the other hand, people are saying, but how about the quality of life in our neighborhoods, in our parks, in our community? So I think the city has to be with a heart, go out, work with people. I think we need to add emergency shelters 
uh, to the city, that's what's lacking. But once we do that and we have all the options available for people, then we have to start moving people out of our parks, from behind vacant buildings, uh, school grounds, et cetera, and get them into services. But we can't have them sleep in, in our parks or neighborhoods anymore. You know, cities that have tried to ban panhandling and, and, and arrest people or ticket people who have been doing it, they've like Albuquerque, actually, they've run into some legal problems. ACLU sues them. And, sure. You know, I mean, so, I mean, are you saying that, that you plan to to kick them off the corner to not let any panhandlers do any of that in, in Fresno? Yeah, that's my, that's my plan. I Congressman mean, David Valadeo and his challenger, Emilio Huerta, faced off in Bakersfield. You watched it live right here on KC24 just a couple hours ago. KC24's Alex Backus has more from Bakersfield. Well, Stephanie, good evening. Congressman Valadeo and Mr. Huerta faced off on the stage behind us earlier tonight. Now, the congressman has proved a tough opponent the last two elections. Meantime, Mr. Huerta, uh, he has been a labor activist. He is the son of Dolores Huerta, of course, the labor icon, who was here in the audience watching tonight. One of the most effect ineffective representatives. No clue what we're doing and what, what's going on. A heated exchange and clear line of differences between the 21st Congressional District candidates. Thursday's debate starting with questions about recently aired dueling attack ads. He enabled Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. Valadeo said he would absolutely support Donald Trump. This ad attempting to associate Valadeo with Ron Donald Trump. Learned. Valadeo has repeatedly said he will not support the GOP nominee. Since he became the nominee, as soon as he became the nominee, I separated myself. Then, where the sold the land to developers for a million dollar profit. Meantime, Valadeo's campaign released this ad accusing the Democrat of purchasing land for low-income housing, then selling it for a million-dollar profit. It's totally false. I've never taken advantage of my position with regards to anyone to benefit myself. Our Evan Onstad and Jim Scott moderated the debate tonight, asking questions about issues central to the Valley, like how to stabilize water delivery from the Delta. So I would reach across the aisle, and, and I, it wouldn't be suspending the environmental regulations. It wouldn't be suspending e the Endangered Species Act. The problem that we have is we have two senators from California who need to step up to the plate and actually help deliver this. Valadeo comes from a dairy and farming background. Huerta has been a labor activist and negotiator. Both weighed in on the new farm worker overtime law. I think it's great. Farm workers are the hardest working people in the Valley. I expect to see uh, more people make less money. The two have contrasting views on immigration, including allowing Syrian refugees into the states. Continue to, to really watch because we really don't have a way to know their backgrounds. And not use religion or cultural identity or, or, or their nationality as a, as a litmus test. Two candidates who want to represent the southern half of the San Joaquin Valley with a fight for water and much at stake. It's about time that we change what's happening here in the valley. It's about the future of our children. I've been blessed to have a lot of support around the valley um, and we're going to continue to work through this home stretch. Now, Congressman Valadeo has won this district twice now, even though Democrats in this district have double-digit voter registration numbers. I'm Alex Backus reporting in Bakersfield. Back to you. The House Speaker Paul Ryan campaigned in the Valley today for Congressman David Valadeo. I was the only reporter to speak to both of them. Now, we met up at the National Raising Company in Fowler. That's where Valadeo showed off one of the Valley's cash crops. But in our conversation, it was Ryan who wanted to show off Valadeo, who he calls a standout in Washington. He's a workhorse. We got two kinds of people in Congress. You got show horses, you have workhorses. David Valadeo is a workhorse. In an interview exclusive to KC24, House Speaker Paul Ryan wasted no time Thursday praising Hanford Congressman David Valadeo. I've been here to the Central Valley a few times. I've learned about the water issues here because of David Valadeo. On five different times just this year in Congress, he has passed the vital California water legislation. I think this issue is going to be fixed, and I think it's going to be fixed because of David Valadeo. Valadeo says he shares his optimism, but needs more help from California senators, saying water is the top issue. When you see people put up tanks and have commu uh, community showers, this is the United States of America, not a third world country, and that's something that that is just unimaginable, but something we have to make sure our senators know about and so that we can get them to be supportive and help us move the legislation to the president's desk. One question that needed asking was the influence of Donald Trump. Ryan has said he will not campaign for his party's nominee, hey, while Democrat Emilio Huerta is running ads trying to tie Valadeo to Trump. The congressman's opponent is using Donald Trump almost like a political weapon 
against him. Are you seeing this other places? Sure. Is, is how difficult is Donald Trump making your job? Because I know you're looking at keeping that majority. Right, right. So that's my job as the Speaker of the House is to help keep our majority. Um, what you're seeing from the National Democrats, they're running cookie cutter, one size fits all campaigns across the country uh, to do anything but talk about the issues. Some people, though, still say it's still fair to tie a Republican congressman to the person at the top of the Republican ticket. Well, look, I think David Valadeo and every other member of Congress can speak for themselves as to who they are and what they believe in. Both men went straight from the National Raisin Company plant to a nearby home in Fowler for a dinner and fundraiser. The Huerta campaign released a statement saying in part, Valadeo and Ryan will be meeting behind closed doors with wealthy donors. Nobody but their rich friends will know what they discuss. However, it's safe to assume they won't be talking about the interests and needs of working families in one of the poorest congressional districts in the country. Now, this campaign-related stop is just one of 12 for Ryan here in California in just two days. To watch the entire interview uncut, Join us for this week's Sunday Morning Matters. It airs Sunday morning at 8 a.m. right after Meet the Press. No matter how you feel about Hillary Clinton politically, when she walks onto this stage tonight to accept the nomination of the Democratic Party for president, she is making history. And people here in Philadelphia say this is the perfect city for this to happen in. They say the best tour guides are the locals. And in Philadelphia, local knowledge goes way back. I love it down here. Every time I come down here, I get goosebumps. I'm such a big, big history fan, and I just love it. In the shadow of Independence Hall, steps from where this country's foundation was built, local teachers Michelle Stingle and Joan Warwick were only too happy to stop and talk history. And they came together collectively to say, we want something different. We want something new. And it's not your idea, and not just my idea, but it's all of our ideas. And I feel like Philadelphia sort of encompasses that. They picked a great place to create history. As Clinton becomes the first woman to accept a major party nomination for president, delegates from around the country say Philadelphia is the perfect place to witness history. I mean, everywhere you look when you're walking around the, the city, you see this you know, building or this church and how old it is and the Liberty Bell. And then you're comparing it to, you know, uh, probably our first woman president. We certainly hope our first woman president and all that's going on with that. And it's just like sinks in. It overwhelms you. It's a city of history. It's a great place to be for this historic moment in American history. I think we need a woman president in there. Let's let's see what she can do. Let's give her that opportunity. First female president, that won't be determined until November. But this is history nonetheless. And perhaps no one is happier that it's happening here than the Democrats who live here. Philadelphia is the city of first. I, I'm just filled with pride. The California delegates are many, but they don't have the best view in the house. Here is center stage. California is way over there off the floor. Of course, after this week, that's when the real work begins for both parties, and we'll be watching exactly what happens next. Donald Trump accepted the Republican nomination for president Thursday night, making the strong claim repeatedly that he is the law and order candidate, referring to recent attacks against police, international terrorism, as well as terrorism here at home, and also just making the assertion that America is less safe today after eight years of Barack Obama as president. He also reiterated and doubled down on his talk about immigration bans from certain countries, talked about building that wall between the USA and Mexico and ending sanctuary cities. He also hit out at Hillary Clinton many times at one point, almost turning the tables on her slogan, I'm with her, saying, she has it wrong, I'm with you. As the balloons fell, it marks the end of a very exciting and unpredictable four days, one where delegates, most of them, worked very hard to bring the party together, while other delegates, as well as Ted Cruz, made some trouble and controversy when Ted Cruz, for example, did not endorse Trump for president at the end of his speech. From here, most of the delegates are going to head home tomorrow after packing up. We're going to pack up and head to Philadelphia. That's where the Democrats will convene on Monday. And if it is anything like the last four days here, we're going to have a very exciting two weeks on our hands. I'm Evan Onstott reporting in Cleveland with your local election headquarters. There's subsets. You've got people down on their luck. You've got criminal vagrants, professional panhandlers. For those who really need help, we'll get it to them. For those who don't need help or want help, that's who I want to run out of Fresno. I feel like you guys 
agree on a lot of things when it comes to public safety. Well, sure. there's a difference, though, perhaps, in how you're going to pay for it. Jeremy talks about a thousand cops. You're not going to get a thousand cops now, and I'm a guy who believes in paying for things and telling people the truth. We're not going to get a thousand cops right away. That's certainly an ideal, but it's not happening. What, what are we going to get then? You can get probably another hundred cops. I've talked about selling unused vacant land that, that exists in Chestnut and Beheim or Herndon and Brawley. The city has done its own analysis. It can generate about $10 million. The city can do naming rights for the convention center uh, and get one or two million dollars operating just like Tachansi Park. And the police officers know I know how to get this done. I've done it before. Mm -hmm. I know how to make our city safe and I've done it before. That's why I have the endorsement of the police officers, the deputy sheriffs, Sheriff Margaret Mims, Police Chief Jerry Dyer, former Sheriff Steve McGarren, because yeah. they know I do things with integrity, with honesty, and I know how to make the city safe. And I did it before, and we're going to do it again. But he I'm not going to mislead mm -hmm. people by saying, we're going to get 1,000 cops. I'm going to tell them the truth. Yeah. We can probably get 100 police, but we're not going to get 1,000. I'm me. not misleading anybody. I know exactly how we're going to get there. And uh, Gary didn't do it. Mayor Patterson did it. And Gary fought him every step of the I way. He hated Mayor cops. Patterson. Uh, that, Still does. That's a, t that's a total falsehood. First of all, what Jeremy again doesn't understand, Mayor Patterson and the council did it because not, there's not one, in, one dollar that gets spent without the city council authorizing it. And I, had, right. I supported every expenditure to hire police officers, every one. All right, let, let, me, let me just ask this. Facebook is where so many of these campaigns are, are, are run now. It's, it's a new world, a whole lot different than when you ran for council the first time. But on Facebook, we get to be aggressive. Jeremy, th this was on one Facebook post. This is things he wrote. Truth is foreign to Gary. Gutter style of politics. Bereft of integrity. Bereft. Good word. Thank you. Gary will tell any lie to get elected. Um, yeah, it's sad. Tell me, tell me what you really feel. I mean, is, yeah. is, this, is this hyperbole, or, or do you believe these things? And I, then I'll let you respond I hope so. I wouldn't put that if I didn't believe it, and it's sad. It's sad how many lies that Gary has told in this campaign, and some of them are well, your garden-variety well, yeah, political but, lies. But what, uh, What's the big one? The big one, he said that I viciously attacked Holly Carter, who was in this race and came in third. Viciously attacked her. I didn't I attack her at all, and that is a disgrace yeah, that ahead. he no, accused me of that. Here's what happened. Somebody put out a, a website taking her personal pictures and humiliating and, and embarrassing and her. And I did that? I didn't say you did. But what I said, uh, the other two candidates, me included and the Carter Pope, denounced it immediately. And Jeremy Pierce said it was fair game. No. It's not fair game. That's gutter politics. That's and not what he, I said. You did. You said it's fair game. No. The meeting where that happened, yeah. Gary didn't show up because it was a conservative meeting and Gary didn't want to be seen there, so he doesn't even know what happened at that meeting. Uh, I do know what happened. You didn't say that? No, right. I didn't say that. Okay. Well, yeah, well, I'm telling you, I'm looking you in the eye right now telling you I didn't you say did that. You did say it. You have proof that I said it? You said it. I believe we need more treatment for this drug rather than legalization. Local leaders speaking out against Prop 64, hoping to convince voters not to legalize recreational marijuana. Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Stephanie Berugian. Evan is on assignment tonight. KC24 is your local election headquarters. Fresno County Sheriff Margaret Mims joined local clergy today to fight against Prop 64, which would legalize recreational marijuana in the state. KC24's Gregory Wood spoke to one pastor who has a personal reason for his opposition. Greg. Well, Dr. Kelvin Morgan is a pastor at Harvest of Harmony International Church. He says he took his first hit when he was in the seventh grade. And I was that child in the seventh grade who bought my first marijuana joint off an ice cream truck. Kelvin Morgan is now a senior pastor. But he says marijuana use could have prevented that. My life was destructive. That's why Pastor Morgan and clergy from different churches stood with Sheriff Mims to say no to Prop 64. In Fresno County, there are nearly 2,000 young people under the age of 18 seeking treatment for some kind of addiction. 69% of those are seeking treatment for marijuana addiction. But not everyone is against Prop 64. As far as people being more strung out on drugs, I think the case will be that you'll see less people strung out on hard drugs. Spencer Robinson is a medical marijuana patient and was in Colorado when it was legalized there. I think once you legalize marijuana, you kind of give people more of an option than saying, all right, go out to the street and find hard drugs. You have a safe access point for them to purchase it. Still, Pastor Morgan believes okaying marijuana use sends the wrong message to children and would do more harm 
than good. I believe we need more treatment for this drug rather than legalization. Now, Proposition 64 will be on the ballot. Election Day is literally two weeks away from today. Reporting in the newsroom, Gregory Woods, KC24 Local News. That matters. Water problems in Northeast Fresno has already been an issue in the race for mayor, and today it popped up again at the Fresno County Board of Supervisors. In almost every way, the county has no jurisdiction over these water issues, but when Supervisor Andreas Borges brought up the issue, he and fellow supervisor and mayoral candidate Henry Perea butted heads, and it ended in an argument that played out in front of the public. Super, you're the one that made the statements, and you're the one that put it into political context. No, I put I, it in the context my of us being yes, the county just, supervisor. Hey, we are going to talk this about This isn't it. even in our jurisdiction. <clears throat> Heated moments Tuesday at the Fresno County Board of Supervisors as county leaders waded into city territory and a major political issue in the race for Fresno mayor. I hope this isn't a political drill or publicity stunt. And probably I shouldn't allow the item to even come back. Board Chairman Buddy Mendez tried to get off the subject of discolored water and lead content in Northeast Fresno, but time and time again, it broke into arguments. Of lead contamination as by the federal guidelines, about another 40. And it's still were going on, the Chairman. Guidelines. Either, you, hey, either, I'll either wait, open it up. <clears throat> I just want to stop this. We're not accomplishing anything. Water came up after a request by Supervisor Andreas Borges, a supporter of mayoral candidate Lee Brand, who happens to be running against fellow supervisor Henry Perea. In politics, everything seems to be fair these days. KC24 political analyst Don Larson says nothing surprises him anymore. And in what could be a tight race for mayor, he says there's no way Perea is dropping this issue. And it could certainly, depending on how it's worked with and what is done, it could certainly have an influence on this election and the vote. And at this meeting, the water wasn't toxic. The topic was. I'm sorry that you're uncomfortable with it, but now I'm I not uncomfortable with it. We have no jurisdiction. And over we're going to talk about it. The sole purpose of this today was to make certain that we were kept abreast of what the county jurisdiction is in recent developments. Yeah, there's a good chance we're going to talk about water and about many other issues facing Fresno as Henry Perea and Lee Brand will debate head to head live in prime time on KC24. Join us Wednesday, October 12th from 7 to 8 p.m. And your question may make the cut. Hit me up on Twitter at Evan Onstein. I wanted to move on right now to Prop 57 because that's been in the news recently with the sheriff actually mm. getting that voicemail sure. yeah. from the governor. Yeah. We've heard a lot of, I want to start with you on this, Charles, be, from the defense attorney point of view because we've heard a lot of negative hate about Prop 57 Absolutely. here in the Valley, which makes sense. What's your take on this? Well, one of the things I think that we should focus on is one of the things that's within that initiative is that is to change the decision to, to prosecute minors from the district attorney's office to the judges that are hearing the case. I just finished a trial with a 14-year-old minor who happened to be with gang members who happened to be where there was a shooting. Now, clearly, to the district attorney's office, they knew that he wasn't the shooter, but he was charged as an adult. And we had to pick a jury of adults to, to prosecute this minor. And the reality of it is, I think that should be made a decision by the judges, not by the prosecutor who's making the decision to prosecute. That's, that, that's an interesting and that's, point. And that, that's one of the things I really like about Prop 54. The other thing I, I think the reality that we've got to look at is that we're tired of spending more money on prisons and schools. And we're tired of spending more money on prison guards than we are teachers. And that's the reality we have to choose. That's the that's reality of choice that we have to deal with right now. And that is prison guards are making $150,000 a year. Teachers are not making even close to that. And teachers create the opportunity for, 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 for the state to get better. That's true, although clearly Prisons you, do can, not. you can look recently and say it's also a much more dangerous position at the same time. It is, and I, it should I, be paid better. I want to bring reason. Aubrey in on this because we don't have that much time. Well, it, I mean, yes, obviously, if you, if you tackle the schools and you create more opportunity, you're talking about a larger societal issue. And I feel that, it, to your point, um, the fact that these issues dealing with minors are getting buried into this other part of this initiative, which is the early release of minor offenders. And I think you're opening yourself up to, it could be, a lot of loopholes here that could be taken advantage of by the criminal mind. So, I mean, if, if my last offense was a, was a violent crime and I'm enrolled in the system and I'm adhering to probation or parole and I have, you know, go rob a liquor store and say, hey, call the cops, I want to get caught, I'm now out of the system and doing this over here instead and I'm dealing under a new playing set of rules. So there is a lot that needs to be worked out here, I, I, but I totally agree with you in terms of you're right. If we had more investment on one side and not in another, you're absolutely correct, but I don't know that this is going to be the way that that gets settled, but this is part of the debate that's going to take place. Mm -hmm. Taking I, some what away I'm talking about, I'm talking about minors being prosecuted right. as adults. 
themselves. Yeah, okay. Right now, that's the decision made by the district attorney. No, and I think it you're should be made by the judges. I, I don't think that that's a negative, but it's unfortunate that that's going to get lost in Within this conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So Governor Brown is apparently very, 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 very busy right now. <laughs> 789 bills to sign or veto this month. I love reading his veto messages, by the way. Um, he just signed SB 32, the climate change mm -hmm. law. Is there anything sticking out that you think that he will veto that has passed? Aubrey, I know you've been looking at a lot of those. Um, you know, keep an eye on, oh gosh, some of the stuff dealing with feminine hygiene products I think is probably going to get nixed. Um, uh, keep an eye on some hot ones that I, w that I would keep, keep watching. Uh, in terms of the environment, look at methane. This is becoming the new hot button issue within the environmental community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's a there's a bill there dealing with methane as a pollutant. Um, and then I would also keep an eye on some of the labor issues. 1066, which is the Ag Labor Overtime Bill here oh. in California. There is yet to be determined if he's going to go one way or another. You look at his history as the founder of the ALRB, and there's a right. lot of history there saying he should be signing that. But there's, a, there's definitely still a lot of those out there who think he might, on economic grounds, not sign that. So that's becoming an interesting oh. debate, which actually I think is elevated to a national level as well. And he's aged out, too. I mean, when he was on the ALRB, he was he was in his 20s and 30s. Oh, yeah. Now he's in his 80s, so he's thinking more like a conservative. <laughs> so I, I would suspect we're, we're adhering to, to Churchill on this one. I, <laughs> I, I don't know if conservatives will say that Jerry Brown's thinking I don't like know a that he would say that either. He would either, but I think the way he's, he's responded has been much more conservative than it was we, when Governor Moonbeam back in the 70s. <laughs> I hear you on that one. we got to stop right now. We're out of time. Thanks so much, guys, for being here. Cruz in California. The state GOP convention continued today in Burlingame with keynote speaker Ted Cruz. The Texas the senator spoke to a sold out lunch crowd, hitting some big points important to the valley, including water. KC24's Alex Backus is in Burlingame with more on his visit and reaction from valley political leaders. Connie, good evening. And Senator Ted Cruz scored some big points at this convention here today, addressing some key issues in California. The Texas senator had the most visible support at this convention this weekend. You can see walls like this are covered with signs for him. His campaign at this convention in full force. Cruz, 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 Cruz. Cruz supporters decked out in red filled the state convention Saturday. One of them is Fresno City Council member Steve Brandau. So I've got my uh, my badge on today, and I've been very supportive of Senator Cruz. <laughs> Cruz scored big points with Valley leaders addressing our state's water crisis with the Delta smelt. If you increase the population through fisheries. 20%, 30%, you ought to be able to go with sending that water on to the, to the farms and ranches and Californians who need it. The message hitting home for Janelle Seibert. She's the president of the Madeira Republican Women. Her husband is an almond grower. Water is our livelihood. And to hear that he agrees that water is being wasted, going down the delta for a little tiny, as he called it, a bait fish. <laughs> Unlike Friday, no chaos or violent protesters at the hotel today. Party delegates from the Valley say Cruz best tailored his speech to Californians and were disappointed they didn't hear the same from Trump. I was disappointed. I did want to hear him speak about the issues just like Cruz did. I was surprised that he was that informed on issues um, in California that mean so much to us in the Central Valley. Meanwhile, Republican attendees take aim at the Democratic frontrunner and post signs saying, delete Hillary. After the Indiana primary Tuesday, Valley leaders hope to see the three candidates make stops in the Valley before voters head to the polls in less than six weeks. God bless the great state of California. Tonight, Cruz's newly announced pick for VP Carly Fiorina also spoke to a crowd here, many telling us this is the busiest state convention they have seen in decades. I'm Alex Backus reporting in Burlington. Game. Back to you. Do we feel the burn? Visalia felt the burn. Saturday, lines of supporters waiting hours to see and hear Senator Bernie Sanders. We're feeling the burn out here, literally and uh, emotionally. But before their candidate took the stage, he spoke with us one on one, talking immigration reform. We have 11 million undocumented people in a system now that just does not make any sense. College tuition and even addressing our local service men and women at bases like Lemoore. I will not send our brave men and women in the military into wars that they should not be going into. I voted against the war in Iraq and I think that was the right decision. Then Sanders spoke to the people referencing East Porterville's extreme water shortage multiple times. I did not know that there are thousands of homes right around here. 
That is unbelievable. That people have got to go out and buy bottled water. Is that the case? Yeah. When people in this area have to go to local churches in order to use portable showers and sinks. He also mentioned the poverty in Tulare County. While we have seen a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires, over a third of the population in Porterville lives below the federal poverty line. For now, continuing his campaign in the state that will make or break his chance at the presidency.